When I was about nine years old, attending private Christian school in Heath, Ohio, I distinctively remember an event that absolutely scared me to death. Now, because it was private school, my mother had to drive my sister and I to and from school every day. There wasn't a school bus because it was outside of my immediate school district. Well, one particular day, my mother had picked us up from school, and instead of going straight home, we, uh, well, she decided to do a little shopping. We went to the mall, a Hills store to be exact. Anyone remember Hills? <laughs> I'm not sure if they still exist, but none do in my area anymore. I'm quite surprised that I actually remember that particular detail, but anyway, my older sister was also in the car with us, and her and my mother went into the Hills department store and left my little sister and me in the car, or rather the van, I believe it was at the time. Why she left a nine-year-old and a six-year-old in the car alone, I am not totally sure. I don't recall if I threw a fit and refused to go in, or if she just trusted that we'd behave. And this was, of course, the late 1980s, so I'm not sure if she was too awful worried about kidnapping in the small town that we were in. Nevertheless, after they didn't return for the amount of time that I naturally expected, I started to get really, really worried. I started to panic. Why? Well, I was just nine years old, but at the time, I had already had it pounded in my head, indoctrinated, if you will, through parental teaching, forced church services, and the private Christian school I had no choice but to attend, the Christian doctrine of a secret rapture. The church, those that had been deemed saved by the blood of Jesus, would suddenly vanish into thin air. Cars would crash, planes would fall from the sky, and it would be it would leave the rest, the unsaved and the unbelievers, behind to wonder what had happened. Well, as I said, only being nine years old at the time, in the fourth grade, I hadn't a clue whether I had been properly saved. I was deeply fearful of this teaching. I was terrified of being left behind. And when my mom and older sister didn't return within that time, I immediately got it in my head that they'd been raptured and I was left behind. I was left alone to fend for myself and eventually I'd be burning in hell because I wasn't forgiven, properly saved, or on my way to heaven. Could you imagine that fear? The fear that I experienced at nine years old? Maybe some of you don't even have to imagine. Maybe you've had that fear. I remember vividly how I was crying, I was sobbing, I was completely broke down emotionally. Even my younger sister had to somewhat comfort me. It was emotionally and psychologically draining and damaging. And it was obviously damaging enough that as I sit here and write this at the age of 38, nearly 30 years afterwards, I can still remember that day and how I felt. And obviously, my mom and my older sister didn't magically disappear that day, or any other day for that matter. They eventually arrived back at the car and I was immediately comforted and soon forgot about the entire event. But it was etched in my memory forever. I don't even think I ever told my mom why I was so upset that day. I think she just thought I had missed her or I simply thought I had lost her or something, but I'm not 100% sure. I also vaguely remember that even going into the store to find them, but obviously failed. And frankly, if mom was still alive today, I'd probably ask her if she remembers that, but unfortunately she has since passed on. So I lived the greater part of my life with that fear instilled in me. No matter how many times I had asked for forgiveness, how many times I prayed, how many times I asked to be saved and for Jesus to come into my heart, I was never completely sure I would be taken in that rapture. I would constantly believe that I had sinned, perhaps subconsciously unable to verify and subsequently ask for forgiveness, that I'd be left behind. I lived with that exact fear into my teens, my 20s, and even my early 30s. It wasn't until after I became more educated and more aware of things that the fear subsided in its intensity, but didn't disappear altogether. Even in my adulthood, I would question my status of being a born-again, saved Christian. I would ask my father over and over. My father was a preacher's son. My grandfather was a, was a pastor. But I'd ask him, how, how do I know with absolute certainty that I'm saved from hell? 
He would, of course, always tell me, as long as I believed that Christ had died for my sins and rose again, and I'd ask him to forgive all of my transgressions, that I would be saved. And I believed every word of it. I believed that if I continually asked for forgiveness for every little sin I was guilty of, that I'd be okay. I'd be saved, and I'd be taken away when that rapture occurred. However, sins are hard to keep track of. We all know that. I lost it after women, I smoked cigarettes, smoked pot, drank alcohol, took other drugs, had premarital sex for many, many years. When I reached my mid-thirties, religion and God basically slid to the back of my mind. It became less of a priority in my life. I no longer attended church regularly, I no longer was that worried about it. I still believed it and I was still fearful of it, but I didn't didn't let it bother me as much. I didn't let it run my life as I did when I was younger, and I began to have doubts about the validity of Christianity as a whole. I began to wonder if the Christians really did have it right. I wondered what my life would have been like had I been born in a Hindu country, or a Muslim country, or a Jewish country, or anywhere other than the United States where Christianity is prevalent. I probably would have been a believer and a follower of one of those other religions, right? The religion we follow has a lot to do with what geographical location we're born into and what faith takes precedence there. And I started to wonder what religion was really about. Wasn't it all created based on a fear of death, something we could believe in and look forward to without wondering if death was the end? After all, humans are the only known beings to have rational knowledge of their own mortality. And we don't even know if animals are self-aware, let alone whether they are aware that someday they will die, someday they will cease to exist. But we do. We know that our lives are finite. We know that one day we don't know when, but nevertheless one day we will be gone. And we tend to like to believe that this short existence isn't all there is to life. There has to be more, right? And I still do, to this day, want to believe that there is more. But as a rational, critical thinker and as a student of logic, I have to also seek the truth. Whether that truth is the truth that I want or the sad, disdained truth, it's truth nevertheless. So approximately a year ago, I began my quest to try and find that truth, at least some of it. I had a strong will to see if the Christian faith was the answer to the afterlife or if the afterlife even existed. I wanted to know whether heaven and hell were real places. I wanted to know if God existed. Did Jesus really sacrifice his life on a crucifix so that I could be saved from an eternity and burning torture? All of these questions needed answers. I knew from the start that I wouldn't necessarily find a definitive answer for every question I had. I knew there had to be more human beings out there that also had the same doubts and sought the same truth I was seeking. And of course, the first place I sought that truth was in the Bible. I started reading it, wanted to read it from cover to cover. I figured, as a Christian, that would be the most logical place to find the answers I was looking for. And being a big YouTuber that I am, I also sought out information on videos. And I found a lot of information I never imagined was out there. I also did a lot of Wikipedia reading and forum reading and sources and essays from biblical theism scholars. I truly wanted to reach the bottom of the rabbit hole. I wanted to know the consensus of truth. What did everyone else who had the doubts that I did, what did they believe about the validity and honesty of the Christian faith? Was I the only one that was raised as a Christian but never doubted its truth? Certainly not, there had to be others. So I read a lot, and I watched a lot of videos, and I came to an odd but somewhat concerning conclusion. The God of the Holy Bible, a book that was supposed to have been divinely inspired, was not the God that I was led to believe he was. Have you ever read the Old Testament? It's riddled with incest, rape, bribery, murder, war, slavery, and drunkenness, not to mention a jealous and angry God that destroyed whole cities at a time when he didn't get his way. And this is supposed to be what the Christian God wanted us to read and subsequently understand about him as a loving deity? All of these stories and anecdotes of the Old Testament sound more like the Jewish version of a once upon a time fairy tale than anything that would be real, honest, and gospel truth. For example, let us delve into the story of Noah's Ark and the Great Flood and a perfect example of the insanity of these stories. 
Here are the basics we've all heard. Noah and his wife, his three sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham, and their wives, the only, the only righteous family left on the entire earth, were instructed by God to construct an ark, a big boat, and take two of all the species of every animal on the planet inside that boat because God was angry at the wickedness of humanity and wanted to murder them all and essentially start over. My goodness, just the premise of that story alone is ludicrous, and as you add the details, it gets much, much worse. There are approximately 7.7 .7 million different species of animals on Earth today. Where did they all come from? Did they all emerge from Noah's Ark 6,000 years ago and repopulate the planet? Well, the Bible would like us to believe that, but it's simply impossible. First of all, 7.7 .7 million different species of animals, and two of each, a male and a female, that's 15.4 million animals on one relatively small boat. Not to mention the nearly 1 million different species of insects that currently exist. What would they all eat? What about the animal waste? What about the fact that the floodwaters were supposed to have risen well above every mountaintop in the world? Now, Mount Everest is a whopping 29,029 feet above sea level. And to be above that, you're talking about a part of the atmosphere where only a third of the oxygen exists as compared to sea level. How could they breathe up there? Well, many Christian apologists will simply say something to the effect of, well, God made it happen. God used his supernatural power to allow it to happen that way. But if God had all that supernatural power, why mess with a flood in the first place? Why not just find another, simpler way to wipe out humanity than a worldwide flood? Seems overkill to me. And I learned through my quest that there were not one, not two, not three, but four older stories. Stories older than when the book of Genesis was written, detailing an almost identical story of a worldwide flood. Ever heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh? Just Google it. It's one of those such stories. The story of Noah's Ark described in the Bible is most likely a ripoff of an older story that was ripped off of an older story that was ripped off of an even older story. And if that story of the flood isn't factual, how can we trust that any of the stories or content contained in the Bible is? These questions either demanded answers or needed to be dismissed as simply not true. In part two of this series, uh, we'll dive deeper into the Bible and into Christianity's fallacies, exploring the New Testament and the specific doctrine I was taught growing up and where I'm at today in my quest for the truth about God and Christianity. So thank you so much for watching and I hope you'll uh, join me again in part two. Have a good one.